Welcome, church. Today, the first day of October, we are excited to hear and to see what God is doing in our midst. So thank you for joining us today as we go through the Bible. If it is your first time visiting us, you're most welcome. Uh, or if you've been here for maybe the past three weeks, you have uh, been a visitor. We have a tent outside today. You'll meet one of our pastors or the deacons that will um, take you through and just inform you about our church and any other question that you might have concerning our church and our program. So you're most welcome to visit the tent after the service. Otherwise, we are grateful to God that we have an opportunity to continue digging into his word. Today we are in Acts chapter 6. And before we read that, let us ask God for his blessings. God, we thank you once again for your word that brings life to us. We thank you that you're here with us, the life giver. We thank you for we know that Many of us here, maybe our hearts are broken. Maybe we have a lot of troubles at home, with our hearts, at our workplace. But above all, we know that your word is powerful to change and transform us, Lord. So we ask of you this morning that through your word, you would speak to us in your own special way. We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 6. Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, is it not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables? Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit. And Philip, Procras, Nicano, Timon, Paphinus, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they lay hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freed men, men who are initially slaves, but they have their own synagogue. The Cyrenians, Alexandrian, and those from Cilicia and Asia disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him to the council. 
This council is very busy this season of their lives, right? <laughs> Just getting people in and out every time. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against his holy against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the custom which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. They were supposed to be terrified, but they went ahead and summoned him and killed him. But this chapter poses for us something very unique, and I have titled it The Unique Problem of the Church. <laughs> it's a very unique problem that we see as the church progresses, as the church is growing and Many people are added to the church. These things are bound to happen. As we look at the history of the early church, we see God's mouth at work. First, we are told that he added to the church daily. Then he also multiplied the disciples. But we are not told that he divided the church. So that is not God's job. He will add, he will multiply, but he will not divide the church. Satan is the deceiver and he's the divider. And we've already seen him at work. We see that he attacked the church through three things that we have seen already. Number one, persecution of the church. Corruption and hypocrisy and complaining and murmuring. They tried, the religious leaders and the elders, they tried to persecute the church so that they will not continue sharing the gospel. Stanley, they would tell them not to speak in the name of this Jesus again. But that did not go through. And secondly, corruption and hypocrisy. Satan came and deceived this couple, Ananias and Sapphira. They, in fact, the apostle told them that they did not deceive any man. They lied to the Holy Spirit. And so, he thought he's gotten into the church. He's gotten grip really good. But that was purged by the Holy Spirit and it continues. And then here what we see is complain and murmuring. This chapter presents us a, a unique situation of the church. Mixed feelings of neglect by two groups insinuating that the widows, their widows, are not put into consideration. We would say that the church was experiencing growth pains, or what my wife would call a growth spot when children are growing. Things are happening in their body, sometimes they lose their sleep. There is a stretch, there is something that is happening. But we see that these Hellenists are complaining. The Hellenists, or the Grecians, were the Greek-speaking Jews who had come to Palestine from other nations and therefore may have not spoken Aramaic language of which even Jesus spoke. While the Hebrews were the Jewish residents of the land who spoke both Aramaic and Greek. And the fact that the outsiders thought to be neglected 
this created a situation that could have divided the church. However, the apostle never gave Satan a foothold, for they knew the schemes of the Satan. He, he, he doesn't have something new. Just do the same thing over and over. Just, you know, change the language here and there. Change the people who he's going to use here and there. But he's the same deceiver. The same lies that he's used before are the same lies he's going to use today. The same challenges that were posed when the church began are the very same challenges we see in the church today. There's nothing new. And we see in the problems that the church are facing, also they teach us various lessons. Number one, this problem teaches us to examine our ministries and to discover the changes that are needed for the church. Because consider these apostles, that their hearts are very into serving people. They are praying, they dedicate themselves to reading of the word and explaining the scriptures to the people. And also because the resources were brought at their feet, they would take them and divide them amongst the people as they had need. The Bible told us that people sold their possessions, they sold their houses and their land, brought it so that people who had need would be served equally. So this man, I believe, they're just serving people honestly, going from this place, this location to the other. But remember, these are thousands and thousands of people. Perhaps they won't go into, you know, the serving every individual. It is not possible for them. It's a lot of people. So when this happened then strategies have to be employed. So these problems gave an opportunity for them to examine the ministry and to discover the changes that are needed. Number two, it gives us opportunity also to exercise our faith, not only to the Lord, but to each other too. This situation led them to appoint men from within to serve. D.L. Moody used to say that it was better to put ten men to work than to try to do the work of ten men. Put a lot of people to work than trying to figure out all these things by yourself, you will die. You remember the story of Moses? He was told by his father-in-law, if you keep doing what you do, you're going to kill yourself. You're going to kill yourself. Appoint people to deal with these issues, domestic issues. Appoint men, elders who will deal with that so that you will at least focus on other things. If they did have wisdom to figure it out, then they will come to you, not because you can figure it out, but you can go and consult God about the issue. You can take it to the Lord. So the church, as it is growing, we see that these challenges are also coming and it poses us or it causes us to also go on our knees to ask God to give us wisdom to know what to do. This is the first time. This is the beginning of the church. There was no structure that they, they, they had for reference. They had to pray. 
And we also see that church is both an organism, that means it is living, and an organization with the sense that there must be proper order for it to function properly. There must be order. And we see that now they are calling into the disciples and the congregation to bring men forth. And these men, they will be ordained for this specific ministry that is currently lacking. We see that also this problem gives us an opportunity to express our love and also an opportunity to apply wisdom to various situations that comes our way. So, because the church is alive, because we are the church, and we are alive in Christ, we are given opportunities to express our love to one another. John MacArthur, I listened to one of his teachings, and a bunch of students were listening and, you know, there was a, an opportunity for them to ask questions. And one of the, of the gentlemen asked John MacArthur that because you are serving thousands and thousands of people every week, how do you know or how does the church know that they are loved. How does the church know that they are loved? And in very few words he says, the best way to love your church is to commit yourself to teaching them properly every week. I mean, he's not able to go to every house every week. But you know what he's able to do? to dedicate his life to searching the scripture, to pray, and to deliver God's word appropriately. And that is one of the best ways that we can know that our leaders really love us. It is a twofold ministry that we are called into as church leaders to feed the flock and to warn the flock. To feed and to warn. And the apostles instructed the church to seek men from amongst them, not men from outside, men from amongst them. And we see also before we come to that aspect that when the church is growing, there is, number one, a perceived lack of concern. A perceived, not truth, but a perceived lack of concern. People will say, now that we have a lot of people, maybe the leaders are not concerned with our lives. I've never seen one of them at my door. I've never spoken to one of the church leaders. So as the church is growing, there is a perceived lack of concern. And for many people, large congregation means not being able to attend to people's needs. So when people are hunting for churches in various locations, they say, well, I don't want to go to a big church because they won't know who I am. I won't get to intimate fellowship. They won't know me. So let me just find a smaller church. When the church is growing, also, the expectation, there is the expectation for the leaders to fix the problem that arises every time. Mr. Fix it. <laughs> Fix our problem. Fix it. It's your job. 
when the church is growing, there is also the rise of internal conflict. We are not being served well. My friend has been here. Nobody talks to them. We haven't been served like the other place. All these things are happening, or they do happen, when the church is growing. And sometimes people are not gracious to leaders because they think intentionally they have chosen not to reach out to us. And this is what is happening in this early church. The Hellenist complaining against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So they supposed that because we are strangers, we are not originally from here, this is why we are treated this way. Do you think that was true? I don't think so. They are dealing with a lot of people. And when, when this was brought before them, they didn't say, hey, how dare you accuse us of not serving people? They didn't complain about it. All they did is say, well, we have a situation. Choose seven men from amongst you, bring them forth. I don't know why they chose the number seven to represent this rising need. But perhaps they borrowed this from the Jewish culture. In their councils and their leadership, they always chose seven men to spearhead all these committees that they would have. Or they would have judges who were seven. And perhaps we have um, copied from them today with our judges. It's either we'll have five judges or seven. So that when they vote against an issue, we'll have one higher number than the other. I don't know if that was the reason, but nonetheless, they chose, they brought uh, seven men from amongst them. And these were the qualification for these men. Number one, men of good reputation. people that we have seen serve, people that we know their testimony, their testimony of Christ is with us. We can attest that these men are walking with the Lord. Not just choosing people because we have seen them actively serving in, you know, the carrying things and helping people with a few things. They might be Helpful, but they might not qualify to be deacons. Men of good reputation. And number two, full of the Holy Spirit. They must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Not doing or walking according to their own perceived direction or according to the flesh, they are led by the Spirit of God. They are not led by their emotions. Because remember, if this is a very sensitive matter that is brought before them, if there were men who were led by emotions. They would choose sides. Say, so, well, I go with these people. That is right, and they ought not to do that. They must listen to us. 
full of the Holy Spirit. And number three, full of godly wisdom. Earthly wisdom is very crafty. In fact, James says that it is devilish. Heavenly wisdom is, first of all, peaceable, gives peace to the hearers when you speak. So this man, these seven men, were brought before the apostles, and they prayed for them and laid hands on them to take on the ministry. And also note that the seven men appointed were Greeks so that they can serve the church better, including the group that were complaining. And the group that were complaining were the Greeks. So by God's wisdom, these Greek men were chosen. And it wasn't anything to do with tribes. For this man, they had proven themselves before they were called. They met these expectations. They were full, good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and they were wise. How did they know that? Because these men were already serving. Do you know the best way to go about choosing leaders? is to find men and women who are already serving. That is the best way ever. Just see people day one and you're like, wow. <laughs> see people wearing suits and like, yeah, you're the bishop today. Thank you. <laughs> you land yourself into a lot of trouble. And we try to practice that. Uh, before we, we set up a ministry, we got to find people who are willing to take up that ministry and serve in it. Not start a ministry and try to find people to go fill in. You land yourself into a lot of trouble. The model of the scripture is always the best. It remains to be the best. But then as these men are brought forth, the apostle said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. We were doing it before, wholeheartedly, but we didn't reach everyone. But this should be known that we are not going to leave this and serve table. So men have to be appointed to serve. And as they are appointing these deacons, this is what they say. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. At whatever cost, this has to be protected. The ministry of prayer and sharing of the word. This was the priority of the apostles. Two things. To pray continually and to administer God's word. Pray continually. You pray that God will give them wisdom that God will always open doors for them to go and share his word, that God will protect them amidst the people who wants to destroy them, who wants to kill them, that they will have boldness and courage to speak it. They've been told every time they're brought before the council, they are told, don't speak anymore in the name of this Jesus Christ. And when they go out immediately, that is what they're going to do, <laughs> regardless of what they're told. Obedient to the voice of God and God alone. 
as situation arises, praying and teaching of God's word should never be neglected at any given point. I, I am not able, and we are not able, to go to every individual. But as God brings many people, many other men and women will be appointed to serve. So when you see a deacon approaching and they want to help you or they're giving instruction, know that the elders of that particular church has appointed them and they have some authority to serve in a local church. I mean, think about it. If it was, you know, the pastor who is giving direction to everyone, you know, welcome to church, have a seat right there. We have children ministry over there. You want me to take you? All right. You will die <laughs> too soon. That is why God is appointing many people. And you guys have seen, you know, the, our servant team with yellow t-shirts. They are here to serve. They are here to help us be comfortable to receive God's word. Sometimes they will approach you, you know, you have a child like, hey, can we go to this place so that the sanctuary is destruction free so that people will listen to God's word? Because we want God's word to get to everyone. We don't want destruction when God's word is being preached. Children are a blessing and they have their place over the other side, right? We love children, but we don't want them to distract us. Sometimes you can, you know, you, you, you're trying to put your minds together, what to say, like, <laughs> what is happening? Do we have people with children there? You know, all these things we have to consider them as we are serving. He said, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And when this happened, it says, and this say, please the whole multitude. And they brought all these people, set them before the apostles, and prayed and laid their hands upon them. The result was God's word got ground to the point where even the priest came to the faith. Think about it. The, the men who were trusted before that they were teaching people God's word, explaining the law to the people, they're getting born again. The pastors are getting born again. It's amazing. The Bible says that the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. We have other priests and elders who are not obedient, who are calling them in question every time. But right here, we see that many, not just a few, many of them <laughs> are being obedient to the faith. They thought they knew. They realized they need Christ. And you know, many times you walk around you and you ask people, especially when you're doing, you know, one-on-one -on -one evangelism. Many people say they're Christians. Many people say they go to church. But you can be sure those many people are not born again. They've gone to church all their lives. They've been to church all their lives. You remember the family of the Levites who were supposed to serve in the temple. Those are the same people who crucified our Lord Jesus Christ. 
they should have known better. But they didn't. Very blinded. But the result was there were a lot of wisdom. People came to the faith. People came to know the Lord. And one guy is mentioned here, Stephen. The Bible says he was full of faith and power and did great wonders and signs among the people. He is a deacon, remember? But God is using him greatly. That means God's power is not limited to the chosen few that we think. If you've given yourself wholeheartedly to the Lord, He will use you. Regardless of who you are, where you are from, God will use you mightily. You ready to be used of God? I don't know. I want to be obedient to His word. I want to be discerning. I want to discern and know. Because if also if the disciples and the congregants were not discerning to know better, they could have brought crooks to be ordained. But God was working in them also to know that this man has qualified. A man who is full of the Spirit of God. A man who has a good testimony. A man who is full of wisdom. And I would say, no pun intended, but the many people who are deceived nowadays in churches are women. Right? Maybe it's not true. Maybe it is. You come to a church like this, as a young woman, you see a lot of guys around. <laughs> Some of them did not come to worship the Lord. They are on a mission. And they will take whatever time it takes for them to fulfill their mission. They'll be good looking. They'll do, if they're hunting for a particular lady, they will find out whatever things they like. If you like reading, they'll bring books to you. <laughs> if you love sharing the gospel, they'll provide you means to go out and do and serve the Lord. Or they will support you to go do it. You love pizza. Voila. <laughs> they will take you to the best joint for pizza. Whatever things you love, they will make sure they bring it to you. And they will be patient. Whatever time, They'll be patient. And then at the end of it, you know what happens? Because these things, they win our hearts. Right, ladies? <laughs> the environment and the attention and, you know, the, the, the more you spend time with a woman, the more you're breaking them walls. And then after some time, when things get serious, people are in a relationship and marriages, and like, hey, that was not me. I wanted you, and I used whatever means to get you. Have you guys heard this story, or I'm the weird one? <laughs> they happen, right? 
It takes a man or a woman who is filled by the Spirit of God to know the other who is filled by the Spirit of God. If you don't know, you will be deceived. You'll be deceived. Don't let the enemy deceive you. Walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. We see an introduction of this man, a great man, Stephen. The Bible says here that he's a man full of faith. He's endowed with God's power and was used by God to do many signs and wonders. He was a deacon, but God still used him. You might be in Asher, God will still use you. You might be a teacher teaching kids in their classes, God will still use you. You might be a greeter at the door, God still will use you. You might be helping with the parking over there, God will still use you. But then, the ministry, as his ministry was, you know, getting bigger and bigger amongst the people, there were a group of people who conspired against this man and they accused him of three major things. One is a blasphemy against God. Two, blasphemy against the holy place, the holy temple. And number three, blasphemy against the customs of Moses. And then he'll be brought before the council and he will defend the gospel. He will not defend himself. He will defend the gospel. Speaking the truth of God's word. We won't get into what he said, it's a whole chapter of it, chapter 7. We'll get into it next week. But this man, he's introduced when there's a problem in the church. A problem of, you know, equal distribution. Our widows are not being served. Our people are neglected. Maybe they were not the only one who complained. Maybe other people complained, but it never got to them. These are thousands of people. Thousands of people. Sometimes I think people ought to be gracious <laughs> to a few people who, you know, are leading people. Perhaps, you know, if he came and said, hey, I know you guys are you know, doing a great job of explaining to us the scripture. You guys have dedicated your life, you're praying, and you've committed your life to doing these things. The great things are happening. But you know, there are other things that are happening that probably haven't come to your attention. What better way can we serve these people that are this other side of town? What better way can we serve these widows? What better way can we serve these orphans? You know, presenting it to them as something that they can pray about and think about other than just, you know, complaining about it and coming full on the apostles. You know, because, you know, the, the Holy Spirit was working in them, at least, there, there was patience. They didn't just react. Say, well, who do you think we are? Or who do you think you are? <laughs> they considered the matter. Though it was a complaint. Because these complainings will have them every generation and every season of any church. There will always be a people complaining. 
Maybe we haven't had it, but there are people complaining somewhere. <laughs> there are people backbiting somewhere. It is just human. There are people gathering in a corner somewhere, talking about someone else, talking about their leadership, talking about this and this. You know, if anyone would come to you with a story of someone else and you entertain them, you are part of the complainers and the murmurers and the backbiters. You guys know the best way, one of the best way to shut those people down is when they begin speaking about someone else. It's like, well, you have spoken well. This is what I want to do. I want to call that person. I want to bring them on board and say the exact thing that you're telling me in their hearing. What will they do? Will they continue? But if you don't do that and you listen to them, you give them the power to continue tearing people apart. You know what you're doing? You're giving the devil a foothold. These apostles did not give the devil a foothold. So, well, that is fine. Bring people from amongst you. This is the requirement of them. We pray for them and they'll continue serving. And the church, the Bible says, it multiplied greatly. It multiplied. Please, I want to beg you. Don't entertain people who bring other people's issues in your hearing. Do not entertain them. Be wise. Don't even say, well, I didn't contribute. <laughs> you contributed. The fact that you didn't say nothing about it, you contributed. You gave them a hearing. Sometimes these kind of things, they lead people to have very few friends. And it's probably it's better that way. <laughs> to have a lot of people that you will talk about other people, or to have a few people who will be productive in your ministry, in, in your serving, at your workplace, and serving people and all these things. Be warned. I don't think these men who were uh, appointed were murmurers, were complainers. These were men that were seeing serving people. <laughs> I had a, one of our cover pastors was in his teaching. He was saying there was a, there was a conference, a leadership conference. And many, many, many men attended it. And so in, during the break times and people are catching up, a group of four guys, leaders of churches, got together. And because, the, you know, the, the, they received God's word and all, they were just, you know, confessing their sins to one another or their struggles. And one of them said, hey, you know what? My struggle is this. I struggle with lust a lot. If my congregants would know about this, I don't know if they would come back to church. And they would be remorseful about it. And the next person says, this is my struggle. I struggle with my taxes at the end of the year. <laughs> I don't want to put the correct figures I want to do something fishy every time. It's a struggle for me. The other one, struggling with lying. And the, the, the last one was an interesting one. He said, I struggle with rumors and backbiting.
I struggle with that. And I don't see this meeting getting to an end for me to go and share all these things with other people. <laughs> you know, when, he, when that happens, what is going to happen is that church is going to be torn. People have real struggles. People have real situations going on. People just don't want to talk about them because you don't know who you're going, you're going to talk about it with. These qualifications, I thought they're something to embrace. Men of good reputation. What, what is our reputation? What is your reputation? How do people know you? Your workplace, at your home, with your colleagues. What is your reputation? Are you a man full of the Holy Spirit or full of yourself? Are you walking with the Spirit of God? Is he leading you or you're leading yourself? Do you correctly apply God's knowledge? Do you have wisdom? These are basic things that every believer ought to have. Regardless, every believer. It was not just for them. It is for us. Ministries get busy with a lot of things. And this phase of our lives here at the church, we're going to get busy with a lot of construction and things happening at the land there. We don't know when God is going to call some of you to become deacons, some of you to become pastors in this church or in other places. We don't know when. Maybe God has called some of you, but you're, you're rigid, you're resistant, you're resisting the Lord. For how long will you do that? When you know for sure that there's a call in God, of, of God in your life, come talk to us. We'll pray together and see what the Lord does. The Lord is into saving people. The Lord is into adding to his church. The Lord is into healing the brokenhearted, restoring people, restoring families. We have a lot of testimonies of a lot of our young people. What is happening in their lives here is amazing. And we thank God for that. As I bring the worship team to come, I'll just remind us that no church is perfect. You'll not find any in this planet. It is not about perfection. It is about direction. Are we going towards the right direction? Or are we leading ourselves towards the wrong direction? It doesn't matter how fast you're going. If you're lost, you're getting lost quickly. But if, if you're following the Lord, you're sure it doesn't matter how long it will take. The Lord is going to use you if you're willing. The Lord is going to walk through you if you're willing. We see even in the Old Testament, God in God choosing David to be a shepherd over Israel, David was already a shepherd in the wilderness. He was gaining experience in the bushes, in there. God never calls lazy people. 
There's, there's no place for lazy people. In fact, Paul says people should work with their own hands so that there will also be a blessing for those who need. Means you're blessed to be a blessing. Be a channel that God can use. You know, some of us, you know, like our hands are like the, you know, this old kettle. <laughs> they, it comes and it doesn't go farther. Just here. Goes back to you. Goes back to you. Let God use you. Let him use you. When he shovels his blessing into your life, shovel it out. Get it in. Take it out. You watch and see how God will bless you when you do that. And this is not something that it is just a myth. This is something that is very practical that we know for sure. How God uses people. You use God with your resources. It's not like, it's not a bet. That if you give God, you know, 10,000, He's going to give you 100,000. That is not how it works. Serve God with what he's given to you and watch your life and see what God will do through you. When there is an expectation for the church leaders to fix it, we, we, we don't know how to fix things. We, we can only pray that God gives us wisdom to know how to go about them. If you fix things, for, for the husbands who are here, you know for sure you cannot fix your wife. <laughs> for the wives, you know you cannot fix your husband. You can only pray to God that their hearts will be softened, they will know how to go about issues and all that stuff. No one can fix the other. And if you try to fix the other, Watch how trouble will follow you. <laughs> Sometimes you might have seen the things we haven't seen yet. Be gracious and bring it to the elders so that we can pray about it and seek the Lord towards it. We are not all knowing. We are fellow human beings. The way God can use you, the same way God can use me. Amen? Just surrender your lives to God. Give yourself totally to Him. He will use you. One amazing thing that the disciples did, they did not kick these people out of church because there was complaint. God gave them wisdom and they properly applied it and the church continued to grow. Pray that God will give us wisdom too. Of course, that was not a church discipline. If it's discipline and it comes to the worst, we'll tell you to see the doors. But God is gracious to every one of us. He grants us opportunities to return. He gives us opportunity to serve him. But these qualifications, they have to be in check. Your testimony. You might not know it, but there are people, you know, there's such a great cloud of witnesses around there. They, 
they see how you treat your fellow brothers and sisters. They are watching you closely to see what a man, what a woman you are. Is your confession of Christ and what you do in line? May God help us. I know many of us are called to serve. Do not resist God. Do not resist Him. He can use every means to bring you on board, but if you've heard His voice, Lord, we are thankful. Thank you that your, your voice is clear to us. For them who are called by your name, as you say it in your word, that your sheep knows your voice. And when you call, they follow. For many people who have been blinded, they don't see clearly. Lord, I pray that you open our eyes. For many of us who don't hear your voice clearly, open our ears and our understanding. For many of us who don't want to take a step of faith to go, Lord, help us. Help us to be on motion to come and serve you. As we are, we are running to you. We are running to the Father, falling into your grace. We can't hide no more. We have nothing to hide anyways. Lord, we pray that you help us. And today also as we serve you, with our finances. We pray that you help us to give that which brings glory and honor to your name. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.